Father God, we come this morning uh, desperate for you to work, desperate for you to move. As a deer pants for water, so our soul longs for you. God, this morning there are many things of excitement. The kids' VBS, the decorations on the platform, uh, summer, Father's Day, there's a lot of things that we could I'd be thinking about, God, but I ask that you allow us to put those things for you, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us. God, may we be still in this moment and remember that you are God. Lord, I ask that you'd help me to get out of the way of what is distracting from your spirit. May your spirit uh, just be able to pour out through me into the hearts of us as a congregation, whether in the building or online. Thinking even of Shirlene, who I forgot to call this morning. And um, yeah, just there are people that are that are just being ministered to by your word. And so, God, I ask that you make um, transformation in our hearts possible. And that we walk away from this place changed by the power of your Spirit and living in that power. Thank you for being our Heavenly Father, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. So in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray these things. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, we did just finish this VBS week, and it'd be uh, important for me to talk about something that we learned in VBS. So I'm going to reference a passage of Scripture that we talked about the very last night. If you open your Bibles, the Second Timothy will be in the third chapter of Second Timothy. But this idea of concrete and cranes, God building a firm foundation. The kids watched a little animated video every single day of a little kid who was taught always build a firm foundation, and and he was uh, became a little bit self-centered and a little bit prideful of how successful he had gotten as the youngest architect in the world, and he was challenged to build the tallest tower that ever had been built, and he fell short. Uh, he didn't have enough material. They found out later that it was stolen by his competitor, and a storm came, and the competitor's building was falling because it didn't have a firm foundation. His stood, and what he actually did was he created a bridge and connected to the building to give it stability. <laughs> that was the message of the last night. And I don't know where you are with the Lord today. Maybe you are one that has firm foundation and needs to reach out. (laughs) Or maybe you're one that's wobbling and needs to be caught by the gospel truth this morning. But the word of God never returns void. We all need to be listeners to the word, but more importantly, doers of the word. And so to that end, I want to look at a passage from 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 10. To... uh, dangle a carrot before you, if, as it were. Um, I was thinking about a way to, to analyze and to picture what's, what's being talked about today, and I was thinking, how many of us today are going to go and enjoy a nice, juicy steak? How many will either grill this at home, or you'll go out to eat, and you're just like, hey, Dad eats what he wants, and he wants a steak. So today we're eating steak, maybe bacon on the side. <laughs> All right, well, this is a, an expensive steak, I'm sure. Um, I don't even know the, the cut of it. It shows how little my man card gets pulled out. But, um, but I was thinking about this beautiful steak and the expense of it and how we prepare it. And there are certain people who would just feel underqualified. They would probably mess it up. But did you know that the Internet offers solutions to those people? I found the following picture that for some of you will be like the eighth deadly sin. So go to the next slide. Did you know that you can microwave a steak? Oh, man. Now, you, you won't get sick. I mean, you can eat raw beef, actually. You won't get sick. So it's just going to heat it up. It'll, it'll go nicely with your mashed potatoes. But this would be a terrible way to cook your steak. If you were planning on microwaving steak today, let me just stop you right now and say, go out to eat, don't waste the money. (laughs) Because methods matter. (laughs) 
right? The, the method of which we cook something matters. I can just cook a steak or I can cook a steak, right? I can just get it hot or I can do it the right way. And so there is a difference in our method. Methods matter. Well, this morning I want us to answer a question of how does God help us to build a strong foundation? And this is Father's Day, and Paul is writing a letter to Timothy, but this applies to men and women alike. There is an element here that we need a firm foundation, and how we build it is humanly true for all people. And Paul addresses two ways that we do that this morning. Well, I want to read the entire passage and let God's Word preach, and then we'll apply it to our lives. And so 2 Timothy 3 Verses 10 to 17 read as follows. You, however, speaking to Timothy, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch and at Iconium and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. So how does God help us to build a strong foundation? The first thing we see here is that God gives us, helps us through godly imitation. The first thing that God helps us to build a foundation through is through imitating godliness. And Paul is one that does this for Timothy. In fact, he says in the very first verse that you have followed And then he gives a long list of things that Paul has done that Timothy has walked in the footsteps thereof. Verses 10 and 11, he says that he's followed in his teaching. That's good. He's a student under Paul, understanding what he believes and why he believes it, and asks questions of the teacher, and he gives him some answers to those questions. Who is God? Why is Jesus this way? And uh, what about Israel? And all these things he's being taught. He's also following, though, his conduct, his way of living, how he handles anger, how he responds to people that are really getting on his nerves, how he handles success, his conduct. He also follows his aim in life. He follows the thing that he's pursuing, which Paul would say in other passages would be the glory of God, would be finish the race, this becoming like Christ, That's the aim of Paul's life, and Timothy follows in his footsteps. Timothy also follows in his faith. The things that he, faith is the assurance of things unseen, right? The things that he takes by faith, the stuff that he just believes because the Word of God says it. Jesus said, He'll never leave me or forsake me. I haven't seen Him lately. Well, God through His Spirit is with us, right? And so we take these things by faith. Paul's patience, thinking of who Paul worked with and as a mediator between the Gentiles and the Jewish people, you don't think Paul needed a lot of patience? And Timothy, as his mentee, as it were, as his pick up the baton from Paul, is going to need a lot of patience. And so Timothy is learning patience. He's also learning love, steadfastness. And so far we're just like, yeah. Let's keep going. Paul's living the perfect life. Timothy, thank you for listening and obeying. Church, 
He also followed in verse 11 his persecutions and his sufferings. And let's just think about what sufferings and persecutions that Paul went through. Because Timothy is going through some of these things too. Wait, you mean Christians have to suffer? Christians are going to be persecuted? Yeah, let's remember what Paul came from. If you look in Acts chapter 14, verses 9 to 22. This is after Paul is in uh, Lystra and he's there. And uh, there's a, a man who needs to be healed. And he says, hey, I'll... In the name of Jesus, you know, you can be healed. And then they think that they're gods. Remember? This is the scenario that they're in. Okay? And then there's some people that follow them from Antioch, and they start creating some murmuring. That's my favorite word, because that's exactly what it sounds like. Murmur. Just this rumbling of talk about Paul and this thing they're doing. And they go from, you're gods, to now that we're going to stone you. And that's the context of this passage. If we look at Acts chapter 14 together, here's what it says. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city, he had made many disciples. They returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Church, I preached on the book of Acts, and we saw this earlier. But let me just remind you, the very towns that Paul was being persecuted in he revisited to show the Christians there that God has sustained me. He didn't face the problem and run away. No, the people that are left there that couldn't move away from the town needed to see Paul being given a new strength. The things that they did to Paul didn't break him. God restored his strength. Clearly seen in the stoning story, these people probably, they presumed him to be dead. They left him to die, and God restored him. Why? Because God promised that Paul would make it to Rome. And I've said this before, but Paul, as stones are coming, was like, I'm not dying today, because God told me I'm going to Rome, and I haven't been there yet. And there's a confidence in Paul, because God is faithful to his promises, and he says to Timothy, hey, just as I've been persecuted, I need you to see that you're going to follow me in this persecution in this suffering. Back to the text, starting in verse 12, it says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, church, we're going to look at later in verse 16 that all Scripture is breathed by God. <laughs> Do you have verse 11 underlined or, or verse... 12 rather underlined or circled in your Bible? <laughs> Paul says, I think most people here are going to want to live a godly life. Indeed, all who live and desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. Wow. Seems to go against the American culture as I understand it today. They seek comfort in every way possible. If we have opportunity to stand up for the Lord and persecution comes, it's because he said it would. And I would ask you to say, if persecution is a guarantee, then is desiring a godly life worth it to you? People that have told you and sold you that Christian life is one that's better and you're blessed and it's for your good, Jesus said count the cost. Because to be a Christian is not easy. It's not for the faint of heart. In fact, in your own strength, you will be destroyed. No, we will be persecuted. Because they hated Christ, they will hate his church. Then look at verse 13, and this speaks in my mind to an awareness of current culture that we should not be surprised by. It says, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Church, 
If we look above verse 10, there's this godlessness that is all over the area that Timothy is living in. But Timothy is set apart. But as for you, verse 10, even you, however, right, the opposite of what everybody else is doing, we as a Christian community should look different than our culture. Amen? Living in the world, but not of the world. We need to be set apart. We can't dim down our lights because it's getting darker. No, be who God called you to be and let the culture change as it will. Be true as a unique people because the rest of the world, evil people, imposters, fake people that are following us, will go on from bad to worse. Notice deceiving other people but they themselves are also deceived. Church, the, the world as it is, is not one that we should avoid, because greater is he in me than he's in the world. But we can't be surprised by its decay. And our job in the midst of the world decaying is to be praying for and awakening as many that are deceived from their slumber. The devil has blinded people to think that they can live without God. The devil's blinded people to think that they are right to pursue money and pleasure and various things in our culture that say this is what you need and the answer is Jesus. So anything not Jesus is a deception, is a lie. And our culture believes it because it it works for a time. But people that are addicted to something often grow in their addiction. They are addicted to one drug or one idea, and it's just eventually not enough because it's not giving me the same feeling anymore, and they go deeper. It happens in uh, Sports Illustrated swim magazines and Cole's bra ads into hardcore porn. It happens in just a little extra money on the side and becoming a workaholic. It happens with doing a little bit of poker or uh, a, a gambling game at the airport, and so now I'm going to the casino every night and my kids are not going to college because I wasted their money away. Sin is a slippery slope, and we need to save people from the downfall. <laughs> but my question to us this morning about this group of passages is that we need to be careful to see who we are imitating. But on the flip side, we need to see who's imitating us. In this passage, in this text, uh, I'm reminded of a Phillips, Craig, and Dean song. I think the text uh, says on here from 1994. So go way back then, uh, just to age myself a little bit. Yes, I was eight years old, okay? This is a long time ago. <laughs> but there's a song that I'm going to cry as I read the verses and stuff over you, I'm sure. But let me just pause and quick and say, this is Father's Day. This is a message from a man to a man. But this is not just for men and their sons. There's imitation that happens for mothers and their daughters as well. There are children that imitate their neighbors. There are children that imitate their coaches and their teachers and people in their lives. Kids are imitators. So we need to be careful how we're living because they are watching. So this song by Phillips, Craig, and Dean, um, I want to be just like you, and you can go to the slide, and I'm going to read it from the back. Verse 1 says of his son, He climbs in my lap for a good night hug. He calls me dad and I call him bub. With this faded old pillow and a bear named Pooh, he snuggled up close to it and said, I want to be like you. Wow. Next verse. I tuck him in bed and I kiss him goodnight at tripping over the toys as I turn out the light. That happens all the time. Legos are the worst. Um, as I whisper a prayer that somebody, someday he'll see, he's, not, he's got a father in God because he sees Jesus in me, Right? If all my kids want to be is like dad, then I'm not living with a bar high enough. The chorus, I won't sing it for you, but it says, Lord, I want to be just like you. 
the Father's prayer because he wants to be just like me. I want to be a holy example for his innocent eyes, these little children, to see the example in their fathers and their mothers and their parents. Help me to be a living Bible, Lord, that my little boy can read. I want to be just like you because he wants to be just like me. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. This is biblical truth. But in verse 2 it says, got to admit, I've got so far to go and there are maybe some men and some women in this room that just feel like they're not worthy of being imitated. Well, this verse is for you, for me. I make so many mistakes and I'm sure that you know, sometimes it seems no matter how hard I try, with all the pressures in life, I just can't get it all right. But I'm trying so hard to learn from the best being patient and kind, filled with your tenderness. Because I know that he'll learn from the things that he sees, and the Jesus he finds will be the Jesus in me. And it repeats the chorus. He wants to be just like Jesus, because our kids want to be like us. <laughs> we are called to imitate godly people, but we're called to imitate God himself. And as people begin to imitate us, Lord willing, they are imitating God himself through the lives we live. And I do not want you to be discouraged by the past. In fact, I found this quote from the movie Courageous, the pastor that directed that film. And talking about the film, he said the following. He said, a resolution is not a pursuit of perfection, but a pursuit of direction. A promise not of perfection, but a promise of direction. And so we will stumble as people, but we're headed towards Jesus. And I can so easily, just admittedly so, be so devastated by my failures, I forget the direction I'm heading. So if you this morning are just on the ground, defeated by your past, I would tell you to just stand up and keep moving towards the King. Every step you take towards Jesus is a step closer to what you need to be. And so we as men of God and as women of God need to pursue a promise of direction. But I can be so self-defeating, feeling like I need to be perfect. And God would say, He alone is perfect. Well, imitation is one element that God gives us for a foundation. And again, I would ask you to think about it in two ways. Who are you imitating? And how are you being an imitator for somebody else to imitate you? We should be disciples who are being discipled. Mentors who are being mentored, right? There's an element of both. Don't apply just one because it's easy. How is that true for you in both applications this morning. Well, the next uh, verses speak of another foundation. Verses 14, here it is again, in comparison to the evil world. Verse 14, but as for you, sorry, this is godly instructions. We have to be grounded in godly instructions. Verse 14, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. As we see in this passage, there is an element here of uh, Paul referencing to Timothy, remember who you were trained by. And if we don't know, if we don't know the story of Timothy, we would think that Paul's like patting himself on the back. Remember, I'm the one that taught you all these things. Why are you fading away into the, to the unknown of what you believe and why you believe it? Paul was your teacher, and there is an element of truth there. Paul did train him. But if we look back... At 2 Timothy 1, verse 5, we see a very important text that branches us well beyond Father's Day and just men doing this. Look what happened in Timothy's life. Paul says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois 
and your mother Eunice. And now I am sure dwells in you as well. He had learned it from his mom and his grandma. (laughs) Timothy had been raised in the faith. So Paul reminds him, remember what you've learned and who you learned it from. And this man was Jewish, and so he would have probably at the age of five began being trained in the Old Testament, memorizing the first five books of the Bible because all young boys in the Jewish culture did that. And if you were selected, you would go on and you would memorize the rest of the Old Testament. But every boy would be trained, just like we train our children in the ABCs and numbers and how to add, they would all be trained to memorize the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. (laughs) Timothy had been raised with this knowledge. Verse 15 says, How from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, the words of God, the holy Testament from the Lord, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. There are a lot of people in the Jewish culture who had the Bible memorized, the Old Testament memorized, that missed Jesus. He wept over Jerusalem. If only you knew who this day was before you, right? But the Old Testament does point to a need to be saved. The blood over the doorpost at Passover, the um, Isaac being spared by his father, and God didn't spare his own son, right? There's so many pictures that God has painted to aim towards Jesus, and Timothy has seen them, and he connects the dots. Jesus is the way to salvation. And then a very important verse, which you should have underlined or circled in your Bibles, is that all Scripture is breathed out by God. Let me just pause there. We don't have time in this service to get into uh, what it means for God to inspire all words, but I do believe that the Holy Spirit, as an editor and inspiration through the people, affirmed everything that was written. But there is unique personality, unique vocabulary, unique style that each author was able to bring as well, right? But we as a church need to nail down the inspiration and without error of the entire Bible or it's a slippery slope. If, if one verse becomes, that's not really what it means, which to me sounds all like Genesis 3, God didn't really say what the serpent said to Eve. Be careful. (laughs) Then, Then did God really say that you would be saved from your sins? Did he really say that his blood was enough? Like, when does it stop? When does the Bible not being true, where does that line get drawn if it's not all true? The Bible says that all Scripture is God breathed. And it's profitable. It's for our good. It, it's not to hurt us. It's to help us. And I know in our culture, and I'll, I'll branch onto this because it's true, we don't like it when it talks about certain lifestyles. Homosexuality currently is a big issue because it just doesn't match what it seems to be logical. Well, does the Word of God say something about it? We're going to branch in a couple weeks, so I'll, I'll open this Pandora's box on Father's Day, about divorce. What does God's Word say about these things? We better value God's Word because it really does offend us. But if it's God's Word, I hear it differently than if it's Pastor Josh's words or the, the church down the road's words, right? These are God's words for our, notice, profitable for our good to teach us, to reprove us, to correct us, and to train us. And I thought of these four ideas, these words, really as just teaching you knowledge, helping you understand who God is, that Timothy got from Paul, but also to point out areas of problems, reproof, and to correct from there a new path for correction, and to train in how to continue in that path. You see, So here's what God's Word is, and here's where in our life we're doing wrong. Conviction, reproof. Correct that. Now how do I continue in the right direction? It's for all those benefit things. It's not only just educating us and who God is, but it's also correcting us. And it's keeping us corrected. 
God's word is powerful, sharper than a double-edged sword, and we need to read it more. It is one of the elements of the foundation that God gives to us. And notice in verse 17, and again, I, this is very uh, gender-specific because of the audience and because of the author. I w- I'm not going to change my Bible to say that the person of God, I don't think that's appropriate to what the t- message is here, but, but guys and ladies in the room, the Word of God is for all of us, not just for the man of God. See verse 17. <laughs> that all of us, Timothy, you as a man of God, may be complete, equipped, for every good work. Church, do we believe that if we lost this book, the Word of God, that we couldn't do what God called us to do? It says here that the Bible, the all Scripture God breathed, is what's given to us to equip us, to complete us, to help us. And so if we lose the Word of God, there would be a negative effect in our life. If, if I didn't have a copy of God's Word before me, I wouldn't know to, how to respond to certain situations in life. What does God's Word say? I, I wouldn't know. This is why people that do Bible translation is so important. Because there are people groups today that still have not seen the Word of God. There are people groups today that do not know who Jesus is. In fact, there might be people living in the house next door to you that don't know the name Jesus. Because there are homes that don't have access to a Bible, but hotels have Bibles, we have Bibles on our phone, and so people might just think the Bible is just this good book to read. It's the Word of God. And those of us who have trouble reading it, who have trouble giving time to read it, I wouldn't ask you to think about adding it to your calendar. I'd ask you to consider the author. And when you do, see how important the book becomes for you. Consider the author, the finisher of our faith, right? The one who began a good work in you, who's faithful to bring it to completion. Our verse from VBS, this is the author of this text. And so I want to hear what he has to tell me because he has my best interest at heart. As I said before, we as a family are leaving uh, today for a road trip, eight hours. You can pray for us, pray for our children, pray for our dog who will be in the back of our vehicle. Uh, It's a a good trip, but I pray that it's one that goes smoothly and that the kids remember for whatever brings, not that they uh, ask, are we there yet, you know, about an hour into the drive. But as a kid, my mom was a teacher, and we had summers off, and we took trips all the time. We did road trips a lot. And one of my favorite things to do as I got older was to be in charge of the Atlas. And some of you in here don't even know what that is. That's like a Google Maps that they printed out, okay? And there'd be a map that you would have in a book before the internet, and you would turn to a page that had this region of the world in it, and we would highlight our, our route we would even like circle things we wanted to stop and see, like, hey, look, a museum of the world's biggest toilet or whatever is on your route, you know, things that you used to do back in the day. Um, but I remember like just being excited of the journey and seeing, hey, the next town's going to be, and oh, there's a restaurant up here on the side. And, and that was something that I looked forward to as a child, knowing what was coming next. And it's hard to explain this now because you have your cell phones, but maybe your cell phone dies, so that helps. Now, the atlas that you used, thought you had in the car is missing. And you're driving somewhere and you are lost. Church, the Bible is God's roadmap for how to live life. And you don't need a roadmap to get home, I understand. You've driven it enough. You could probably drive it in your sleep. And if you've like driven miles and just like, I have no idea what I've been doing the last whatever, but I'm safe, and you just have like this wake-up moment, or is it just me? We can just kind of go through life, and there are some times we don't need a map, but if you were going somewhere you'd never been before, if I dropped you off in the middle of a country in Africa and gave you a map on how to get somewhere, and the map flew out the window, you would be without hope. You would be kind of wandering around, 
Well, God's word directs us through areas of life we've never entered before. And it walks us through things that we think we know where we're going when we realize we actually don't. (laughs) The danger for us is to put this somewhere and forget about it thinking we don't need it. But God said, write the words of him on our heart, (laughs) right? To keep it close, meditate on it day and night. These are what the Bible says to do with his word, to feast on it. And so we need to be reminded the importance of God's roadmap. The kids were reminded of those things this week, of God's importance in our life. And if you have children that came today, I'm asking you, don't let them forget. We're not having VBS next week, so you can't just like keep bringing them here. It's God's asked you as parents to continue to raise your children in the way of the Lord. So tonight at dinner, how is God going to enter your conversation? On Tuesday morning when everybody wakes up, what's, what's going to be about that day that they think about the Lord? This is what God would ask for us to keep the momentum going. God, who began a great work in you, will be faithful to bring it to completion, but so often through the people in their lives, he brings this growth. So church, I just want to encourage us today to do what God called us to do in his strength. But I also want to pause and allow you to respond to the Lord through a song from VBS that you have not heard yet. Um, Administratively, it was a little too slow for the kids. They probably would have put them to sleep. And it might do the same to you if you're tired, and I'm sorry for that. But I think a slow song might be just what you need to talk to the Lord. So while this song plays, I ask that you would take the moments to say, God, here's what I'm going to do about what you're calling me to do to be a person worth imitating, and to remembering the power of his word. Let's pray.